this is a pretty, pretty stellar case. Anyone want to take a shot from, from this view, from low power? Verusiform xanthoma, we've got one option. That's a good thought. So you can either, either type it in chat if you want to guess, or you can unmute yourself and say what you think. Um, got to vote for maybe reticular histocytoma. So I think that person is looking at this area here maybe and wondering what's going on. So to me, I think it looks like we have two different areas. This is a, a biphasic lesion, right? We've got something here, and then this area looks totally different from the rest, some sort of a combo. And that's exactly what we're dealing with, is a combo sort of situation. So let's look at this part first. So to me, I mean, this looks pretty nice, I think, for a seborrheic keratosis. It's kind of one of those kind of warty, pedunculated uh, looking ones. And um, the cells are a little bit irritated and you get a little bit of some kind of squamous eddy formation, but not terribly atypical. Um, although in irritated and inflamed sebs, of course, you can have some uh, cytologic atypia. Um, it's totally understandable. You could also argue and say, well, this could be a Veruca. Maybe those are like coilocytes. I don't think so, but the hypergranulosis would go with Veruca. And I think Verucas and uh, seborrheic keratosis can have quite a bit of overlap. There's nice horn pseudocysts here though. See, those are really nice for seborrheic keratosis. So I, in my opinion, this is a, a big seb. Now let's go look at this area over here and see what's going on. So this is a, a mixture of different kind of cells and patterns in here. Okay, any takers now? I see someone saying maybe melanoma with seb. That's an idea, it's certainly possible. So we've got kind of these islands of atypical cells that look like keratinocytes to me. They've got dense uh, pink cytoplasm. They're kind of have this funny kind of cell within a cell sort of thing that we sometimes see in keratinocytic um, lesions. There's atypical nuclei. So to me, this looks like a squamous cell carcinoma. And then additionally, in between it, there's spindle cells. And the spindle cells also look atypical, have mitotic activity. So what would you call a lesion like this? What name could you apply? Ignore, ignore the seb for a minute. If, what, what would you apply when you see islands of what look like carcinoma? And then in between, you see malignant cells, some of which are epithelioid, but the, they become quite spindly. Yeah, so I would call this a carcinosarcoma if you want to get fancy, okay? Exactly, good job, guys. So to me, um, there, there's two terms that kind of have overlap, sarcomatoid carcinoma and carcinosarcoma. In my belief, I think that those are just two different um, morphologic patterns of the same thing. I think that they both represent a carcinoma that has become so poorly differentiated that it has areas that look like sarcoma, that look like malignant spindle cells, okay? But the way that those terms are often applied is that sarcomatoid carcinoma is totally spindled. It, all of it looks like sarcoma, looks like malignant spindle cell tumor, but there's, there's some evidence either immunohistochemically or from the background uh, of in situ carcinoma that it, that it is actually a carcinoma. Usually it'll look like a, a malignant spindle cell thing and then you'll stain it and it stains for keratin or, or P63 or P40, something like that. Whereas carcinosarcoma usually has an obvious carcinoma component and an obvious sp malignant spindle cell component. So like this, it's got obvious epithelial areas that are nested islands of atypical um, epithelioid cells. And then here it's got sheets of malignant spindle cells. And so it's a biphasic lesion that has a, an obvious carcinoma and an obvious spindle cell looking component. And, um, but again, whichever term you use, they both to me represent just different variations and pattern of the same concept of, of a malignant, um, of, a, of a carcinoma that's become so poorly differentiated, it starts to look like a sarcoma. So in these, if you do, I think in this case of our call, the keratin actually stained a lot of the spindle cells, as well as, of course, the islands of, of carcinoma. But sometimes you can have partial or even complete loss of epithelial markers in the spindled component in a, in a carcinosarcoma. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't detract from the diagnosis for me. It's the, 
for um, uh, Dr. Newton who mentioned the idea of melanoma, that is certainly a, a good thing to consider because that would be a big thing to miss, right? This is a, if this is a poorly differentiated carcinoma, a carcinosarcoma, the, most likely they're probably gonna do all right after having this excision. Certainly it's possible a lesion this big could metastasize, but if this were a melanoma, for example, then this would be a big problem, right? This would be a, a very high risk melanoma that'd be very likely to metastasize. And so I'm never opposed to, when you see a malignant, ugly, poorly differentiated lesion, um, I'm never opposed to thinking about the idea of a collision uh, tumor. So you asked, is pagetoid spread uh, typical with these? I don't know, actually. I would say maybe not, but I have to admit, I don't see a lot of these. I see quite a few sarcomatoid carcinomas or what I usually call spindle cell squame. Um, because someone a long time ago told me, you know, if you say sarcomatoid carcinoma, sometimes that really spooks people um, and makes them think it's much more atypical. And if you just say spindle cell squam or poorly deaf squam with spindle cell features, uh, the dermatologists understand and are more familiar with that terminology. And, um, and to me, it's the same thing. A sarcomatoid squamous cell carcinoma is the same thing as a spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. They're both poorly differentiated squames that have spindle cells. So I don't know the answer to your question, uh, Dr. Wilson, if there if pagetoid spread is common. I would I would guess no. Like here, I think what we have, so so what I think we have happening here, let's go back to low power, is I think that this is a seborrheic keratosis that had malignant transformation into a squamous cell carcinoma, and that squam became poorly differentiated enough that it turned into carcinosarcoma. So carcinosarcoma arising out of a seb. Crazy, huh? We see a bunch of sebs, but we don't see carcinomas of any sort arise out of SEBS very often. It happens, but it's relatively uncommon, especially considering how many SEBS we, we see. So for those of you dermatologists watching, you know, when you uh, want to uh, uh, biopsy something that's a changing or growing thing that otherwise looks like a SEB, it's not unreasonable to do that, not only for the fact that the patient's, um, uh, you know, very uncomfortable, obviously, but uh, also because there are rare times where we can see malignancy either right next to a SEB or arising in the middle of a SEB. So, um, and someone asked, is there a clear um, EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition? Well, I think so, actually. I think right here, I would argue, you can see definitely like in situ carcinoma, nests of invasion. And then to me, I, it really looks like these cells are transitioning into these and you can see they're still epithelioid here, but they're becoming in, dis they're in uh, sheets, diffuse sheets rather than organized nests. And as you track and follow those over, what do they do? They start spindling out. So I think that's a really nice example that we, we rarely get to see such a nice transition um, in, uh, in uh, carcinomas that get spindle cell component. So this is kind of a, a nice case for multiple reasons. And the, uh, also, I was just so impressed. My histology lab, look at that cut. That is like perfection. No wrinkles or folds. A little bit of fat tearing, which doesn't matter how good you are, you can't do anything about that. So um, anyway, if you're a histotech watching this in the future, total shout out to you guys. I tell my histotechs all the time, if it wasn't for their amazing skill doing something that I can barely do, um, even with a lot of, of hard work, I can barely pull off cutting a really nice slide. Um, they, they make just magically beautiful slides that really enable us to do our job. So I have huge respect for histotechnologists. So, you know, buy your histotech donuts or something, or if nothing else, just tell them that they're awesome and that you really appreciate them. You know, in, in, in time for philosophy and, and team, team talk for a second, that's actually really important to do. Because you know what, you don't want the only time that your lab sees you to be when you're coming there asking to rush something, or please hurry up, or why is this delayed, or why did this specimen get swapped. It's important to have those conversations, but you want to also go there when there's positive things. If nothing else, it will make them not dread seeing you, hopefully. But the other thing is, is I think it helps because when you build that rapport with your team, then when you go in and say, hey, can you guys rush this because this is a kid who's really sick and I'm worried that they might have leukemia or something, then they understand, right? They respect and they know that the reason that you're asking for something isn't because you're being demanding or, or, um, or um, selfish, but it's that, that you're actually trying to take care of the patient and that they're on the team with you helping to do that. And so I really think that that, that really helps um, everyone to, to feel like they're part of the team when they understand why that what they're doing is so important. So anyway, there's my little philosophy lesson for the day.